Right. Uh, so uh, at least you've heard what I said, so I'm going to introduce, uh, talk a little bit about our uh, informatics platform, which we have developed over quite a few years, actually. Um, uh, in the company. So for, you, for those of you who don't know much about Aztecs, this, this is just a generic slide in which we introduce ourselves. Uh, we are a fragment-based uh, drug discovery company based, uh, well, the discovery site is based in Cambridge in the UK. And what we do is we screen fragments, our own proprietary fragment library, using a number of biophysical techniques, one of which in our case is always X-ray crystallography. Uh, and that means that um, uh, when we get a hit, uh, we will have a structure of that hit automatically, of the fragment bound to the protein target that, that we're interested in. Uh, and then uh, the next phases are, are essentially taking that fragment hit uh, using careful structure-based design to, to a lead and hopefully to a kind of drug. Right, so when we started the company, um, well, this company was founded in 1999 and I joined in 2000. Um, so the, the informatics platform started around 2001 really and we were thinking about um, ways in which we should, we should come up with this because there was nothing in place. We didn't have a database, we didn't have any software at the time. Um, and the vision that we had is that we wanted to democratize the whole process of fragment-based drug discovery. We wanted all different disciplines to be basically involved in the, in the process. And that meant that they all had to be able to see each other's data and each other's results. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do is to make a couple of special, specialist areas, or areas that are seen to be specialist, uh, available across, across the board. One of which was um, the, the actual uh, being able to view protein ligand crystal structures uh, by all scientists, including nectar densities. Um, and the other was we wanted to make docking and structure-based design tools available to medicinal chemists. Um, and in addition to that, we wanted basically the whole platform to be as integrated uh, as possible and to create an environment where people could share data, share ideas uh, with each other in, a, in an easy way. And certainly at the time, which is about 15 years ago, nothing existed. Um, that we could buy. Um, so the decision was made to write most of these tools ourselves, um, or at least interfaces to them. Um, and um, in addition, we, we decided to, to uh, give access to these tools via web interfaces. That also at the time was, was quite quite new and novel, um, but it was a, it seemed a good idea because people at least were used to using you know, web interfaces, Internet Explorer, etc. Uh, so it's a familiar environment. Um, it was relatively simple to, to develop um, uh, interfaces, although that 15 years ago was not as easy as it is now. Uh, and we could the, the, the heavy lifting really been done on a server or on, on PC clusters. So if I now display our um, kind of process uh, in a sort of more flattened out way, the more the way you will be used to looking at it, that looks very similar to um, other uh, pharmaceutical companies in that we first um, identify the target, we do some exploratory biology, and maybe some biophysics, crystallography. Then we uh, start the fragment screening phase, if the first phase was uh, initial, I mean, was successful. And then we go from it validation to its the leads, and hopefully at the end, we'll get a candidate. Um, now, when we created this database, we, we had all these different aspects um, uh, of the process feeding into this database. As you would expect, so all this stuff was, was written here um, you know, at the beginning of the 2000s. Um, and um, we use that data side by side with public domain data. So for example, the PDB, Kemble, um, Uniprot, and so on, to kind of uh, inform uh, this, this fragment-based discovery informatics platform that was sitting on top of it. Um, so that had all sorts of tools um, uh, that, we, that we developed over the years. Uh, and the nice thing was that we, we use those tools also to enrich or, or to inform, again, the, the process itself. Uh, so I'm going to give examples of, of each of these stages of the process um, of, of how we kind of reuse data to understand and to learn from, um, from, from our own experiences. And the place I'm going to start is the fragment screening uh, phase. So over the years, we've, we've really uh, constantly looked at our fragment library um, and uh, this kind of the longest running pro project at Aztecs to constantly evolve uh, that library. Um, and we do that by, by looking at the results that 
uh, our output from from fragment screens. And one of the things we did relatively early on was to look at the size distribution of the compounds in our library and the size distribution of um, hits, X-ray hits. Um, so in red, we see the size distribution in terms of heavy atoms uh, in the fragments for um, X-ray hits, and in blue, uh, you see the distribution of a heavy atom count for the compounds in our library, the fragments in our library, uh, in this early stage, in this early phase. And we can see quite clearly that there is a shift to the left, you know, to lower, smaller size uh, for the validated X-ray hits. So we, you know, the X-ray hits tend to be smaller. And this is completely consistent with um, Mike Hand's sort of complexity argument that as compounds uh, get bigger, uh, the probability of them actually matching the receptor goes down and therefore your hit rate goes down. Um, so we from that concluded that we needed to have more small fragments, even smaller fragments that we already had in our library and fewer larger compounds. So in the next sort of phase of our um, fragment library, we, we adjusted that and, and you can now see that the, for the sixth generation, this is about 2008, we're talking about there's a very good um, match between the distributions of the hits and the libraries. And that's also true for uh, other physical properties of these of these factors. Another thing we looked at from about 2007 onwards is the concept of um, minimal pharmacophores. So a minimal pharmacophore is an interaction pattern um, that we believe drives at least to most most of the binding of, of a particular factor. So in this case is CDK2. Um, it forms a nice donor receptor hydrogen bond pair motif. Um, with the hinge and um, in, within the molecule itself, that, that is sort of um, done via a, a one bond donor acceptor pair. So, this minimal pharmacophore we call a one bond donor acceptor. And we, we are expecting that minimal pharmacophore to be retained uh, as we develop uh, the compound, as we grow the compound, because we think it's very important. Planarity or 3D ness or shapeliness, whatever you might want to call it. Um, there was a whole discussion, uh, certainly a couple of years ago, about the fact that fragments, fragment libraries tend to not be um, shapely enough, tend to not have enough 3D shape. So we also looked at, at our library in, in, uh, in the light of uh, linearity. Um, so we, we defined something called deviation for linearity, DFP, um, and we would have um, defined four bins, essentially, ranging from completely flat, bin one, to completely 3D <laughs> shaped in bin four, um, and bins two and three, somewhere in between. So we did that for all our compounds in our library and also for all the fragment hits that we found. Um, now for this uh, property, you have to actually split the data out according to molecular size, because um, you know, as your compound grows, as you get closer to bigger compounds, they are inherently going to have uh, more 3Dness to them. And you can see that quite clearly from this graph up here. This is, this is the distributions from our library, um, that the, the smaller fragments have a larger proportion of this blue, blue fragments, which are the planar fragments, and a very small fraction of um, 3D fragments. I suppose. So what we can do, we can compare this plot to the uh, same plot, but now for the, <clears throat> the X-ray hits that we observed. And what we need to do is we need to compare the same size molecules uh, in the library with the same size molecules in the, in the x ray hits. So, if I, for example, look at uh, heavy atom counts of 11, um, then you can see quite clearly that um, the, the hits um, are, there are more hits that are planar um, uh, among the hits than there are in the library. So, there's a tendency of hits to be more planar than the compounds in the library. And if you do that for every, com every comparison, say for a type size 10 or size 8, etc. That is true every time. Um, so that, that's a really quite a statistically significant uh, observation. So the observation really is that for the same heavy atom count, same size, more shapely fragments are less likely to be hits. Uh, and again, uh, we believe that reflects um, Mike Han's complexity analysis in the sense that uh, 3Dness uh, is actually a complexity uh, as well. So add, adding 3Dness uh, adds complexity and lowers your chance of, of finding a hit. So although 3D fragments are useful, um, we need to keep them small. And, and as a rule of thumb, uh, we, we think we should 
maybe be about two atoms smaller uh, for a 3D fragment than for a planar fragment, for it to have a similar sort of chance of, of hitting the target. Um, so to conclude this, this section then on the fragment library, we, we constantly evolve our fragment library and we, we do that by, uh, by looking at the output from the fragment screening campaigns. Um, we've matched the size distribution um, between the library and the hits. Um, we think we've got good coverage of mineral pharmacophores and therefore of chemical scaffolds, um, but we do still annotate um, new, new pharmacophores each year. Um, and um, as I just said, novel 3D fragments are useful, but keep them, keep them small. So that's kind of led to the, the seventh generation library that we, uh, we are in, uh, that we have at the moment, uh, which contains about, about 1,600 compounds and really quite a, they're really quite small, you know, 12 wavy atoms uh, on, on average. Right, so I'm going to conclude this section now and, and hand over to uh, Franca to uh, give you another poll uh, question. <laughs> yes, here I am. So we would like to know from you, how much do you use software for compound ideation? Do you use it all the time or do you still need a good tool for using it every day? Or are you a very old-fashioned bench chemist who always draws on paper? Or do you develop, develop your ideas just in your head? Or do you have people who work for you? <laughs> so it would be kind if you tell us. And... Uh, pretty poorly dropping in now, just 25% of you voted. So let us know what you think. And I'm going to give you five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to close the poll. And here you see the results. So Marcel, you're dealing with people who are mostly modeling their selves and uh, so I think you can stay on the educational level you are already on. So please go on. Thank you very much. I'm glad I'm not having to adjust my talk as I go. <laughs> that would be quite interesting. Uh, right, so we, we, we get to the next phase of, of the, um, uh, the fragment sort of discovery process, which is the hit validation, we call it. So this phase, you have a fragment hit, uh, and you, you want to really um, do some very initial uh, SAR, uh, very local SAR, to establish whether it's a singlet or not, um, and, and just to see, see what, what's going on really locally. Um, and the kind of things you, you'd want to do uh, to a compound, say if this was your fragment hit, uh, is you might want to strip off um, some parts of it. You know, this might not be a great idea, actually, but you might want to strip off this phenyl. Uh, you might want to put small substituents around different parts of it. Uh, you might want to replace the OH, for example, by an H2 or something else. Uh, or you might want to replace uh, one of the rings by a pyridine or a cyclohexyl or something like that. Or, or, or eventually you might even want to uh, replace the ring, sorry, the, the linker system, the linker here, by, um, uh, I mean, uh, methylene or more complicated things. So these are the kind of things you'd want to do. And the, the way people typically would do this is by um, either doing a similarity search um, amongst, say, you know, commercial, commercial vendors, compounds of commercial vendors, um, or by doing substructure searching, again, commercial vendors. Um, and um, uh, we actually found that, that the, the fingerprint method, the similarity searching method, doesn't work very well in our hands for uh, finding similar fragments. Uh, I won't dwell on this, but that's certainly what we, what we have found. Um, and in terms of substructure searching, that is certainly an effective approach, but it can be quite uh, laborious and you, know, you can forget things, because in many cases you might have to do multiple substructure search searches to find all the types of compounds that you're interested in, particularly if you're looking for ring replacements uh, or linker replacements. Um, so the Aztec fragment network is, is something that we have developed relatively recently, um, which, which addresses this. And it's based on technology uh, used by companies like Amazon and LinkedIn and Facebook and so on to, to understand um, interactions between people and people and products and all these sorts of uh, links that you might have uh, with things across the internet. Um, and uh, we use that same technology, which is graph database based, um, to, to build this, this network of fragments. Um, and uh, it works like this. So we start off with one compound 
And the first thing to build the network initially uh, that happens is that you generate a list of nodes and edges. That, that you did, and the way you do that is by systematically removing rings, linkers, and functional groups from a given molecule. So this could be my start molecule. I can remove the OH, I can remove the top ring, I can remove the bottom ring, or I can remove the linker. And if I sort of recurse that further, I can end up with these disconnected compounds as well, and then I, there's nothing else that I can break. And what we then do is we add another four and a half million compounds for, from commercial vendors, from Kemble, from our own house registry, and we see uh, to which uh, nodes these compounds are linked through which edges. Uh, so they're all sort of added, nice animation, of, see that, uh, added to this network. Um, and then when you search the network, when you actually use this, this, this interface in practice, what happens is you start from the node um, that, that you've got the compound for, the one that you're interested in, and then the, the network just finds the, the nearest neighbors, the ones that are directly linked to it, and its neighbors. And that's what it, what it returns, and it groups the results very nicely, as you'll see in a second. It's incredibly interactive. Uh, you know, it's a, it returns in a fraction of a second. Um, and, and particularly medicinal chemists and, um, and modelers, they, they, they really love it. Um, and the, ma the main reason they love it, apart from the fact it's really fast, is that the results are grouped and ordered um, in a way that makes medicinal chemistry sense, um, if you like. Um, let me try and explain how that works. So first of all, the, the transformations are grouped into the logical section. And one of them might be, I've only picked out three here, one of them might be, um, para substitution on the upper ring. So that's what that would be called. Um, um, and another might be upper ring replacements. Uh, and the third might be replacements for the hydroxide. Um, there are more categories. Obviously, I've only put four, eight, and 13 out here. There, there are, as you can see, more. Um, the ordering of the compounds is also interesting. Um, it's done according to how often a certain transformation has been seen in Kemble. So how often you've added a chloro, often in Kemble, a chloro has been added to the four position compared to a methyl and so on, has led to the fact that the chloro is the most common um, uh, substitution on the four position than the methyl and so on. So again, the ordering um, is very sensible. So you get pyridine first, this is the most likely replacement for a phenyl, this second pyridine, uh, and cyclohexyl and so on. And a replacement for the hydroxy, NH2, acid, methoxy, and so on. Um, so just to conclude, conclude this section, then, um, uh, as I say, it's incredibly popular with medicinal chemists because it's so quick and um, basically replaces a lot of multiple different substructure searches um, with just a single click. Um, and the grouping and sorting of the hits makes it very straightforward to, uh, to find what, what you're after. Uh, and what they really like, actually, is the, the final bullet point, which is that the, uh, um, it is entirely linked uh, to our compound ordering system, which means that as you go, you can click compounds um, that, that you like and add them to your shopping trolley. And at the end, you can kind of check out and then uh, the compound order, order will be sent to the, uh, uh, the, the purchasing department who will then um, uh, go ahead and purchase it for you. Unless it's uh, they're ridiculously expensive and then they might come back to you. Um, just to get to the final bit, um, uh, of the process, we haven't talked about this one, but we'll get back to that in a second. Um, this really is where structure-based drug design um, really kicks in um, when you develop a hit um, to, into a lead and hopefully into a, a candidate. So we have developed over the years many different uh, interfaces to do this, and then we'll only be able to talk about a couple, uh, really. Uh, the one that's most popular with our chemists and with our modelers is uh, something we call overlay pages which is used um, for uh, visualizing all of our structures that we generate within a project. Um, and, and also we'll have PDB structures um, sort of superimposed as well. Um, and it's really aimed um, to be very simple, very user-friendly. Um, uh, but at the same time, still have a lot of functionality there. So you can see electron density, you can see pockets, um, identify favorable and less favorable interactions, uh, all with a click of a button. So I'm just going to demo this. Uh, hopefully this will work uh, across the web. Um, Frank, I might have to interrupt me if it, if it actually 
if it doesn't run, we'll... No, I see it from. Um, uh, so on the left is, is, is the visualization 3D viewer, and on the right is, is a panel that will contain, um, on an average project, hundreds of structures. Um, in this case, I've only got two different categories, but they will be nicely grouped by chemotype um, and by series and, and so on. Um, and I'll have structures from the PDB, from competitors and so on. In them. Um, so this is an IAP um, structure, and uh, at the beginning of the project, what the what people would have had to their disposal would be just um, uh, some sort of competitive structures, and this, this is actually the structure of the, um, the final part of the natural substrate, um, this is the peptide. And um, so the, everybody can see these, it's very, as you can see, it's very easy to turn things on and off. I can see the water molecules, I can do things like um, ribbon, I can do very easily look at the fold, um, or I can zoom back into the binding site, um, and so on. Um, so the view of the project, they would have had this, and, and this, this target recognizes this alanine warhead, um, um, and that gives it really most of its affinity, uh, and you can look at the protein surface, and you can see there's a nice, really deep uh, spot. <laughs> at least there's a hot spot for the, for the alanine, you can very clearly see why it likes to bind there. Um, and you would have competitors compounds as well at the time. Um, and I'm uh, sorry, I keep the wrong button there. There's, a, there's one of competitor compounds at the time. There were only peptide uh, analogs uh, around, uh, and we would have had structures of those as well. Um, and then um, as, as we get fragment hits, this was the first hit that we got. It's one of the hits that we got, um, which was the perazine. Let me see that clearer. I can do that. So perazine here. But it lacked the. Um, uh, the methyl that the alanine obviously had in, in that pocket. So one of the first things that the um, chemist did was to, uh, to add um, that, that methyl. Um, and that really does, does uh, kind of ring the bell, uh, so to speak, um, gives you a, a massive jump in focus. Um, now I'm not going to talk really about the, this, this whole project in detail, um, uh, but it led to, uh, to the candidate. Uh, this is actually a lead, it's not an actual candidate. Um, that looks like this. Um, and um, and you can see it's well, I can show this um, hydrogen bonds um, and the waters and all these things. Um, and like I said, we also have electron density. So so anybody who has access to and everybody in the company has access to these pages uh, can click on electron density. This is a two F O C map um, and see uh, and basically interrogate the quality of these of the map in different parts of the, uh, the protein. Um, and you can see this is not actually a very high resolution structure, uh, but the, the ligand is unambiguously defined. But for example, uh, they would be able to see that this lysine here is, is, is not in density, that this is swapping around. So you wouldn't be over interpreting um, the position of that, of that lysine if you saw this. So I'm going back to the presentation now. Um, there we go. Uh, so that was the, the overlay pages. The second most popular interface amongst the chemists and modelers actually is the protein living docking interface, um, which is also a web interface. And certainly in 2001, when we developed this, this was a, a docking a web interface for docking was really quite quite fancy. Um, uh, and we, as I say, we wanted to give this to chemists. Um, and you might might say, well, traditionally this is viewed as quite a specialist modeler task. And in, in some docking experiments, that is that is really true. That is, that is appropriate. Um, because as we all know, you know, out of the box docking um, programs, uh, we shouldn't really expect success rates of more than 50%, certainly for cross docking, which is what we all use in, in practice. So that's where the mo modeler's experience and intuition hopefully should help. Um, but actually, certainly during the, the, the hits to leads phase, many docking tasks are much easier than that because we, we're basically making small changes to compounds with known binding modes. Um, and, and we believe that you know, structure-based design sort of uh, aware uh, chemists um, are well suited to running these kind of topics. Um, there are still uh, some challenges or some tasks for the, for the model that because you know, things like protonation states, tautomers um, of the protein, definition of the binding site, water molecules, which to include and so on. Uh, what scoring function to use, certain parameters, any constraints that you might want to set. They're all still very much modeler tasks, but they only need to be done once or maybe a few times. Um, 
So um, what happens in practice here is that the model that prepares a protein, it finds a protocol which is then saved, and the chemist can then select that protocol um, and, and go away and do it. So, so in practice, this looks, looks a bit like this. This is a, a not quite an old interface, still in our old colors, blue. Um, that's how old it is. Um, and, and you can see you can you have all sorts of settings here. You can select your project, you can select the target structure, the binary set definition, scoring functions, um, and so on. So there's really quite a lot there for the modeler. Uh, so the modeler uh, would, would kind of come up with the best protocol, best scoring function, etc. Uh, and he could then save that once he's happy that he's getting the right result uh, for a particular series, say, um, save that protocol, give it a name, uh, and then pass it on to the chemist who would then see this. So for example, if they try to lock this compound in collagen here, and they would uh, just select the protocol for a the perazine warhead and the, the P4 closed confirmation of this of the Zaya um, protein. Um, they do still have access to uh, to all of the uh, to full functionality uh, should they wish to, to use it. But they would, they would normally go and talk to a model at that point if they, um, if they wanted to do that. Um, right. Um, I have really talked about exploiting large amounts of uh, structural data. There's, there's all sorts of tools that we have in the company to really learn from, from uh, all the statistical um, data that we generate in projects. Um, because we really should be reusing all that structural data um, that we generate. This, this slide is slightly out of date. We're over 8,000 protein ligand complexes in the company now. And I think in terms of fragments, we're, we're pushing for 3,000. Um, now, so we really need to make most of that data, and, and one one interface that, that we use to do this is called Aztecs Merge. It's very similar in spirit to something called Breed that was published by uh, Vertex people uh, a while ago, um, and it basically finds pairs of molecule where, where a bond in one overlaps with a bond in the other molecule. Um, you can use that in, in a number of different ways. You can either run all versus all ligands, and we use that to to cluster fragments. If in some cases we get more than 100 fragment hits in a project, you want to cluster those. Um, but most likely you'll want to run it in a single molecule mode where you have a fragment and you want to see what other things you might want to merge that with. Um, um, a key thing that really helps things is that the fact that the scoring function penalizes trivial overlays. So molecules that are very similar in terms of a chemical scaffold, if they have good overlap, they get scored down. Um, but, um, but molecules that are very different in most of the ligand, but have a very good overlay in, in one particular region, they get a very high score. Um, so this is just an example where we have used this. This was published as DDR1, uh, was published a couple of years ago, where we had this fragment hit in the back pocket of uh, DDR1, and we um, uh, we saw that it had a really good over. Well, Astex merge uh, noticed that it had really good overlap with the satinib, or this particular ring of the satinib here. Um, and so we ended up merging these two compounds and came up with um, much, a compound with much better properties uh, and good affinity as well. This was published, published here. So just to see the actual interface, uh, you can see here's the satinib, you can't see all of it, and here was our fragment here. So these two compounds were merged uh, into, into one. Um, so conclusion from this phase then, um, in, in our experience, providing chemists access to structure-based drug discovery tools is, really, uh, is a really good thing to do. Um, they really give them buy-in to the compounds they're designing, um, and yeah, there's just, 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 just a really much better engagement with the project. Um, the project ligand informatics tools um, have led to new series in, in quite a few projects uh, as well, uh, and lots of bespoke tools that I haven't been able to talk to you about really. We have a, a compound design tracker system where a, a chemist or a modeler can enter design ideas, um, link them to dockings or QM jobs, um, and they can be discussed, shared, etc. Um, we have uh, generated a, a kind of a, an electron density fitting algorithm uh, using, using docking uh, code uh, to solve um, to place ligands into liquid density um, and solve protein structures that way. Um, we've uh, recently published a, a protein ligand informatics force field, which is, um, which is out last year. 
Uh, we have a, a simple QM interface for, for generating uh, ESP surfaces to do torsion scans, uh, uh, compound property calculator, and the sort of that. There's, there's a lot more that we can talk about if you like. Uh, and now it's time for the next poll. Yeah, which fits perfectly in here. We would like to know from you which feature you would value most in a software tool. Is it a multiple protein view to work with, or would you like a visualiz visualization of CH acidic H bonds, sigma N ion holes, and so on? Or would you like to have a covalent docking tool in software? Or is it a 3D, 2D synchronization for the editing process? Or would you appreciate to see a water happiness rating? So you can only make one choice. I know it's hard, <laughs> but please decide what you would like most to see. And uh, half of you did vote already. So for the other half, please make your choice. And uh, I'm going to close this poll. When I see 80% of choices, we're now at 75. So yeah, it's getting closer. I'm going to close it in five, four, three, two, one, and close now. So the result is quite mixed, I would say. Multiple proteins is the favorite, closely followed by water happiness rating and the 2D, 3D synchronization. So thanks for voting. And uh, Marcel, please go on. Thank you very much. Uh, right, you'll be pleased to hear that we're now in the final section of our <laughs> presentation, uh, which, which is a bit back to front in the sense that we have the, the target idea and the exploratory phase at the end. So we even try to inform that phase uh, with data that we can generate, particularly on the fragment screening. And I'll try to show you how we do that. Um, so one thing we did uh, quite a while ago is the, um, something called dig site. And, um, the idea was that we wanted to basically come up with, you know, use all our fragment structures to train some sort of function or model uh, to predict um, uh, fragment binding sites um, in, in proteins that we hadn't looked at uh, before. Um, and the way we did that is, is by, by developing leg sites essentially a bit further. Uh, we, I don't know if you know about leg sites, but it has a number of vectors and directions you look into uh, until you hit the protein. Uh, we added a few more directions uh, to make it less rotation uh, dependent. Um, but then what we did is um, in each, each direction, um, we looked and we measured the distance from an atom, this is a this fragment hit, from an atom in the fragment to the protein surface. So for example, for this, uh, this direction here that I was just pointing at, that is quite a short distance. So it would end up in this bin here. That's quite a short, short distance. This is a distance spectrum that we're building up from all these directions. Uh, this other yellow one also goes into this bin. Uh, this green one goes into that bin, et cetera, et cetera. So we build up a distance spectra from this atom to the different directions until we hit the protein. And then there's one final direction, which is for, for all vectors that um, point into uh, areas that are open to solvent, uh, and they, they, they end up in the, the mop bucket. So we can do this for all Aztec protein fragment complexes, uh, and we did. Um, so we generated thousands of these distance spectra from our protein fragment complexes, and then we, did, we clustered them. And we looked, and we sort of cut them to, down to a reasonable number of clusters we could, we could look at, by eye. Uh, and we, then we did some, some manual uh, pruning, because some of the clusters uh, you know, that consisted of, of atoms, essentially, or environments that were essentially sort of exposed and some stuff like that. So there was some manual um, filtering. But we ended up with, with essentially three uh, spectra, distance spectra, uh, that we wanted to use as a reference spectra to go and interrogate new proteins we hadn't seen before. So essentially the way that works is we, we move um, uh, for a new protein structure that we hadn't looked at before. Um, we will move a probe or we'll move on, on a position on a grid around the protein, generate one of these spectra, and compare that spectrum to the three reference spectra that we've generated from all those fragment structures. Um, and then we calculate basically a similarity, um, which, which we then plot on, on a grid. It's very simple. It basically tells you how similar is this environment to an environment that we've seen fragments bind to. Um, 
So here are just some examples. Oh, this is a relatively naughty slide. Um, these are example, fragment examples. Not, not all of them are recalled fragments, actually, but they're from the uh, Yassig's library set. Um, and if we run LakeSight on this, I appreciate LakeSight is certainly not the best um, pocket finding tool uh, around, but this is what we did at the time. Um, and um, what you can see, it does find these pockets, um, but it doesn't really discriminate very well between the key recognition area where the fragment finds and, and the rest of the pocket. You see. Uh, and if we um, now uh, look at dig site results, you see that that really, really picks out sort of key recognition areas where the fragment does, does find. Uh, this is this is you know, what we see in general. Um, and we use this quite regularly. Uh, for example, um, uh, when we do solve new structures, uh, we will look in, uh, in areas that are lit up by dig site uh, more closely to see if we can see additional fragments maps found. Um, another thing that we did was uh, to look across uh, 24 uh, fragment screens uh, to see how often we see fragment, uh, secondary binding sites. So apart from, say, the ATP binding site of Akainase, do we see the fragment bind somewhere else, or outside the protease, active site, or just outside the PPI interface, and so on. Uh, and it turned out that actually multiple site binding or secondary site binding was the norm rather than the exception. So in two thirds uh, of the targets, we actually saw secondary site binding. Uh, that was published by Fred Ludlow that's on a couple of years ago. Um, but what we're actually asking ourselves is how likely is, is it that these, these sites actually mean something, that they, they, they may have some function. Let's skip over this slide. This is just a few examples from um, uh, the ones that we found, secondary sites that we found. So the way we approached the sort of you know, whether these sites are functional question was by looking at evolutionary conservation. Um, and to do that, we looked at uh, orthologs um, of um, each of the targets in turn. Um, and, and assess their similarity. So an orthologue of CDK2, human CDK2 would be CDK2 in a mouse, for example. And we looked at all species um, uh, have CDK2, uh, and we would calculate um, a global um, uh, sequence identity, uh, and also a sequence identity for any site that we have bound, uh, fragments bound to. And these are the two properties that are plotted on these two axes. So the global sequence identity is the horizontal axis, and the site sequence identity is plotted vertical axes. And each point represents an orthologue, let's say a mouse, uh, CDK2, or binding site 2, say, for example. And you can see that for primary sites, when we look, just look at primary sites, these are the ATP sites, the, the main PPI interaction site, protea sites, and so on, you see there is a significantly increased level of conservation within these sites compared to the rest of the project. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the secondary sites, that is still the case, not to the same extent, that's, that's true, but this is very statistically significant in the sense that these secondary sites, most of them are also uh, much more conserved um, than you would expect from the rest of the protein. So most of these sites are evolutionally conserved, which is interesting. Um, but what about, you know, in terms of drugability, fragmentability, um, do they look like we could actually target them? So if we looked at, for example, at ligand burial for these uh, prime, for the primary sites and compared to the secondary sites, yes, perhaps the average is a bit lower for the secondary sites, but there are certainly plenty of secondary sites that have an, as much burial, ligand burial, as the primary sites that we haven't been successfully targeted. And the same in terms of lipophilicity. So primary sites are significantly more uh, lipophilic um, than at the average protein surface residue. Um, and so are secondary site bindings, uh, so secondary site services. Um, so it looks like these, these, we might actually be able to target these sites with, with, with ligands as well. Um, my final uh, a couple of slides uh, are to show you uh, when we can sometimes even um, hypothesize what the mode of action of a fragment binding to a secondary site uh, might be. And that's uh, the example uh, is for HCV, um, a protease helicase. So this is the protease helicase uh, structure, and here is the protease domain, and the blue is the helicase domain. And the helicase domain um, binds with its C-terminus in the protease active site. Protease active site is here, and as, as a result, it, it auto-inhibits itself. Um, so it auto-inhibits the, the um, phosphatase 
sorry, the protease um, um, activity. Um, and when we um, uh, did our fragment screen, we found hits in this new site, which we call the tunnel site. You can see why, why we call it that. And it spans the region between the helicase domain and the protease domain and that C terminus of, um, of the um, helicase domain. Um, so the hypothesis that we came up with was that, you know, normally um, uh, the, heli the HDV protease helicases in this equilibrium between the closed state and the open state. Um, and in the closed state, it, it can't uh, process substrate or it can, can't bind inhibitors. But in the open state, it can process substrate. And what, what we could see is that, you know, our compound binds in this region between the helicase domain and the protease domain. And sort of it looks like at least it stabilizes that closed form. And by doing so, we would hypothesize that it would drive this equilibrium that way. Uh, and therefore, we would actually block the protease activity. Um, so that hypothesis, we followed up by, by you know, developing these fragments into more potent leads. Uh, and we were able to see that although these fragments have no um, uh, activity in the protease only domain uh, assay, in the full length assay, they, they had uh, activity. Uh, and we even uh, could see activity eventually in the HCV replicant assay. And we're also able to generate uh, resistance mutations around this site, showing that, that really that site was functional. And that our hypothesis of the mode of action was, was correct. Um, so the final conclusions then, um, we have been able to train uh, pocket or fragment finding site um, algorithms um, to train them on the fragment structures. Um, we think X-ray screening can, fragment X-ray screening can be used uh, very successfully to identify uh, novel allosteric sites. And it looks like a lot of these might be functional. In fact, we've shown some of them to be functional when we followed them up. Um, and a lot of them also look like they are potentially druggable. Um, and, and finally, you know, the structure of fragment hits can, can sometimes even help you hypothesize how they might block um, or activate um, an enzyme or fragment. So with that, I'm going to thank uh, all my colleagues at Astex, because obviously there was a lot of stuff in here, uh, and our collaborators as well, and I'll thank you for your attention. I'll hand over back to Frank. Yes, thank you, Marcel, for this very interesting talk. Thank you all for joining today. And next webinar, we have a pretty new thing. Our first scientific challenge has just closed. And one of the finalists of the last challenge uh, will give a talk. It's Andrea Estolfi about structure-based discovery of a new chemical scaffold acting as P38 alpha-mapkinase inhibitors on March 1st.